In my Octane versus Redshift artwork, I created a bunch of crystals. So today I figured we would go over how I went about making those. So a quick overview of the graph here. This is kind of what it looks like with the final thing. Uh, a couple things to note. Uh, this side over here is once it's been output. Um, this left side is more of the actual build and definitely pay attention. We got a for each loop here. That's important because we're gonna be looking at some attributes from that pretty quick off here. And I'm actually gonna to jump to a second one of these so it doesn't have to recalculate. And this is just gonna be a low poly version uh, essentially of the same thing. So the only note that's taken out is this edge damage, which we'll go over that here in a second. So if I look at our tube here, I just started off with a simple tube, uh, just with the radius scaled down and the height scaled up a little bit, set it to a polygon and changed the number of columns. You could probably set this to maybe seven, maybe even eight if you could get away with it, but six is kind of a typical uh, crystal look. You might be able to get some good looks with seven or eight as well, but six is typically what you kind of see in crystals, I feel like. So that's piped into a Boolean. And then on the other side, we have a platonic here. So I set it to a dodecahedron. And then we have a bunch of um, expressions in the different rotation values. So if I pop these out, you can see, if you don't know how the for each loop uh, random rotation and stuff works, that's uh, all being driven through this, then I do have a video on my channel on how to do that. So take a look at it. It's essentially the same situation here. We're just bringing the uh, information from the points in, we're making a random value based off of that, multiplying that by a seed that I have set up in this null. Can control that and change that to get different looks. And then I've changed the rotation values to rotate between, oops, undo that, rotate between stuff that I found to be good. So each one of these different rotation values, I set a, I kind of played with it before I put this in there. I found two values that worked well and gave me a good look uh, for the for the crystals. Because if you turn them too much, if you have too much random rotation in there, they'll turn too much and the tops of the crystals will be flat. And that's just not really crystal-like in my opinion. So I went through each one of these and you can see that they all have different rotation values between them and these last uh, two numbers are kind of what you're looking at. So it'll rotate between 30 and 45 for that, zero and 35, and then 25 and 45 for that. Now jumping into the next transform node, I just scaled it down a little bit to kind of give a, a better look. And then I stretched that out and scaled it down just a little bit more. So it's stretching it in the Y that gives me a lot better look if I set this down to something like one you can see if I look at the top of this the profile is kind of not as pronounced so I can bring that all the way up to something like well not all the way up to two because that scales it too high but I could adjust that uh, easily through these transforms but 1.5 is what I used that just kind of makes this top profile that's being cut out just a little bit more pronounced which I thought looked pretty good so then I would pipe it into an edge damage, which you can see here. So take a look at this real quick. So I set it to a Boolean. Well, first of all, actually, this uh, edge damage node is actually part of the labs tool set. So you will need to go up to this little plus icon, go to shelves and enable your side effects labs or check for the updates if you haven't done that uh, because side effects labs will uh, need to be updated. If you haven't updated them in a while, just click this update tool set because they just actually released an update that has a bunch of new stuff. And one of those is this edge damage and it produces some pretty simple, uh, actually pretty good results, I should say, with a really simple uh, interface and some nice, uh, nice looking results. So I did use the Boolean because if you use the VDB method, it does take a little bit longer to calculate and it's also a little bit smoother and crystals kind of have this harsh uh, edge look to them. So I wanted something to be a little, uh, a little harsher. So that's why I chose the Boolean. 
And then again, I have the seed value here, just uh, based off of the for each loop. And I've changed the element size along with the noise type to a sparse convolution and up the roughness just a little bit to get the look that I was going for. The reason I have a different seed in here or an expression in the seed is to um, give us a different look for each individual crystal. Just kind of makes it look more realistic for the clusters. So you can use that if you want or not, it's up to you. So from there, it would pipe into this transform. So if I look at this transform here, it is randomly rotating the, uh, or sorry, randomly scaling the object here. So if I look in here, once again, I've set uh, different values for each one of these X, Y, and Z. Found something that I liked and I adjusted them uh, accordingly based on uh, what I found. So that's all that that transform is doing. And then I set a match size here just to put the minimum uh, X and Z. So it was sitting kind of uh, on the origin, wasn't going any, uh, wasn't going any further past in the negative X or in the negative Z direction. It's uh, just sitting there kind of at like zero, zero, but uh, not in the center. And the reason for that is because without that, later on, you'll see uh, we kind of needed that to um, make sure that it lines up in our uh, copy to points or our, our for each loop here. So we'll go over that here in a second. But this next transform, I just have a couple of random rotations once again in the X and the Z. So I have set the values here a little bit lower because if you have these too high, you'll get too much rotation. And then the crystals will kind of uh, overlap into each other. And that's not something that I was looking to have happen. And then I also have a uh, for each um, reference again here, just changing the scale. Oops, if I didn't do that. Just can't changing the uniform scale here. Let's give it a little bit more variation. Also, I believe I was uh, kind of stretching things out here. Maybe I was just changing. Now this is a uniform scale, so it'd be just uh, kind of changing the size of each individual ones. I think this, yeah, this one I have set a little bit higher just to kind of stretch out some of the crystals a little bit above what they were because some of them were a little bit too fat. But jumping up here, I have uh, the beginning of our for each loop. So all the points, this is where uh, we are getting our, um, or generating our kind of cluster. So started with a sphere and then I just set the box. This is a super uh, simple way to get um, a good uh, kind of group for the bottom half of a sphere. So just create a box, set the match size to uh, max for the Y value. And that will set the top of, this, of the box um, at the origin so that anything below the origin can be in this group. And then you just enable uh, the bounding box here. You can also do it through this bounding box, but uh, it takes a little bit longer. You have to type in a formula. I just like to do it this way. So the reason that we're doing that is we want to just delete the bottom half of that sphere to get a hemisphere so that we can copy some stuff to the points. So I added some normals. Um, I made sure that there was normals there. And then the scatter, I just scattered a bunch of points on there. And you can see that the points still have those normals. And that's important for when we copy the crystals over to each one of these points we, because we want to kind of align them to where the uh, normals are pointing. We don't want them just pointing in random directions um, or in the wrong direction. So next up, I have a match size here just set to the max because I'm trying to cut out the top uh, points because I wanted to set the uh, redshift logo in the middle of this crystal cluster. So this isn't actually necessary if you just want to create a, a crystal cluster. But uh, I just ran a sphere here at the top of the, the thing, um, the points being scattered here, and then just blasted those away. You can see that those have all disappeared now. And then I just set that back into position. So it, the match size set to min 
and it's now sitting back on the origin. And then I just set a fuse node here just to uh, give us a little bit more control over the uh, spread of the points. So you can really crank up the number of points in our scatter, but still have some uh, control over where they're being placed and how far apart they're going to be placed. So you could also, which I didn't do, and here in the scatter, if you were going to create a bunch of cl uh, crystal clusters, you would want to input a formula into this global seed, much like I did with all of these transform values. So now if I take a look at this, you can see, let's go ahead and turn off our normals. We have a bunch of crystals um, being copied to all of those points, and then I'm just outputting that to an Alembic. So if I go back here and take a look at this transform, I believe, was it this transform? Yeah, so this is the one that is kind of rotating it and then the match size is um, putting it into place. So what I was talking about, if I go back to the for each loop, if I go ahead and bypass this, you can see that without these two nodes here, it just becomes a garbled mess. So with this, um, you can see that the crystals are kind of, you know, matching into each other. So like I said, this is, if I just go back to this one, you can see this Boolean is creating it in the center of the origin, and then our transform is laying that down. And uh, I forgot to mention that I had rotated it 90, deg 90 degrees. And that's because if you don't rotate 90 degrees there, let's go ahead and turn that back on. If I don't do this rotation, you can see that we get that garbled mess that we had before. So that's because the normals, or I guess, yeah, so the normals are pointing out along our, um, our object here but they don't match up with our uh, rotation of our object here. So it's trying to kind of copy them along the, the wrong axis, I guess. So that's why we need to rotate that 90 degrees so that they would all line up properly and wouldn't look stupid. So I would go through and do this first if you're going to recreate this. Go through and do this and then drop in your edge damage on the last step because this gives you a lot of control and uh, freedom to kind of play around with these. So let's say if I wanted to change all of these to, let's say, like um, seven columns. Let's go ahead and set that to that and see that we get a little bit of a different look there or, you know, eight. You get some different looks going, even five, you get some weird kind of kind of looks going there. So it gives you very quick feedback with that. And then I would go in and add this edge damage later. And let's go ahead, jump back out. The other good thing about doing that is you can set these single pass IDs in here and you can really dial in the edge damage. So if I wanted to change this, I can change it, maybe the element size up to 15. Maybe I wanna drop this down. Maybe I wanna change the amount or maybe I wanna really crank that amount up. And you can even, actually, I thought I did it in this one. Uh, I would recommend setting a, another one of these, these type of um, random, randomness into the amount, find your low and your high values. So maybe I wanted to only have this much um, damage going on at the absolute maximum, and maybe I wanted this at the absolute minimum. So you could set essentially the same type of a formula up, and then just in this value, you would set a minimum of like 6.5 and 9.5 for, for example. And then each one of the crystals is randomized. Like I said, I thought I did that. Maybe uh, something crashed or something and I didn't end up doing that, um, but I thought I did. But I would definitely recommend doing that. Just add a little bit more variety into each one of your crystals. 
And then the last thing here, I went through the sphere here, just subdivided it out a little bit, um, made a mountain node just to give it some kind of undulations. And this is just creating the center of the crystal cluster. Uh, I scaled it up a little bit because it gave it a little bit of a better look in the actual render, added a material, and then I just brought in the crystal file here and merge them together with the materials and transform them to the center with a simple uh, pivot transform or no maybe actually i just moved them around uh, by hand so um yeah that's basically the gist of it that's how you would go about creating a crystal cluster um they're a generator for a crystal cluster super easy to set up really not a whole a uh, lot of complexity there, but uh, something I figured I would show you guys. So hopefully this uh, helps you out. You learned something from this. If you have any questions, feel free to ask those in the comments. If you guys want, I can even go over how I went about shading them um, in Octane, but uh, I don't really plan on that at the moment because that wasn't the uh, main focus of the image. And honestly, probably could have uh, done some cooler stuff with those. So maybe I'll dive into um, a more uh, in-depth crystal shading um, exploration in the future, but we'll see. Anyways, like I said, hopefully you learned something from this. Uh, feel free to leave any questions in the comments. Uh, but anyways, I have a bunch of other videos on my channel that have to do with Houdini and Redshift, Octane, uh, some on Cinema 4D and Clarice as well. So if you're interested in any of that, feel free to check those out. But anyways, thank you guys for watching and have a good day.